Good morning, everyone. All right. Oh, that was that worked. The, the coffee is still kicking in. Okay, got it. Un, deux, trois. Un, deux, trois, quatre, cinq. Un, deux. All right. Ooh. I can hear myself really loud. Un, deux, trois. Un, deux, trois, quatre, cinq. Un, deux, trois. Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is my surrogate name, <laughs> Guy Lunardi. I work for Collabra, and it's my pleasure to be here today. Um, I'm joined here by a bunch of colleagues, a lot of very familiar faces, some people I've never met before, so to especially all of you guys, good morning, and, and ladies. Um, the abstract of the talk was end-to-end -end software production um, embedded, and I asked a few people yesterday what they wanted to hear about, because I, don't, I didn't really have a formulated idea of what I wanted to talk about. I think the, the presenters yesterday all did a good job at covering a lot of the topics that I thought would be relevant, so I didn't want to repeat that. Um, and it was an interesting trend. People kept saying they wanted to hear anecdotes about some of the challenges that we see on a day-to-day -day basis with the, the many projects that we have. Um, for all of you that are not familiar with Collabra, we're, we're a consultancy. We don't make any products ourselves. We don't sell any products. We just help people uh, bring to market their ideas and their solutions. Um, the vast majority of our customers are um, SOC vendors, the people that make the chips themselves. We, we work closely with, um, if, if, it, if it runs ARM instruction sets, if they're an ARM licensee, there's a very good chance they're a customer of ours. Um, if there's a GPU associated with it, there's an even bigger chance that, that we're working with them. So for that, I apologize. If you've ever worked with an SOC that didn't exactly do what you wanted to do, it's, it's not the IP people's fault. It's usually there's a, there's a breakdown in the process between the, the blocks that they get, putting them all together, putting them on a silicone, and, and then making it work. Um, and, and we have a lot of friends that, that work with those SOC vendors that, uh, that are the people that produce the, the products. Um, and when you hear BSP, it makes everybody's skin crawl, right? You're like, how good is it gonna be? Like, how, how early am I adopting a piece of technology? And um, we all have battle scars from that, maybe we a little more than others, uh, with, with regards to very early adoption. Um, I go back, Five or six years ago, when, when we started working with some of the newer automotive models that are available today, and, and that was terrible. That, that, was, that was probably one of the most troublesome time for the whole embedded Linux area that I've lived over the last 20 years. Um, we wanted to do so much more with, with so much more compact systems that, that we managed to cram a, a ton of technology, a ton of capacity um, in, in those we call them ECUs, they're not engine control units, but the, that name sort of ended up being everywhere, um, that, that we got ourselves into a lot of trouble. Um, the markets are medical devices, smart televisions, smart devices of all kinds. We stay away from the very, very, very small ones, generally because they don't have a screen and a lot of the customers that work with us, they come to us because there is a screen attached to the device. That's kind of a pretty good way to, to put it. Um, except now there's just not one device. I'll use cars again as an example. We have some models where we're driving eight, nine, ten screens sometimes. The entire instrument cluster boards are like two, three panels and we have to deal with safety. The standardization ISO 26262, which you've never heard of that, is sort of the requirements where you need to guarantee uptime, you need to guarantee fallover, you need to guarantee all sorts of stuff that, that make these things complicated. So I think Collabora is the only a uh, software consultancy that does free software that's ISO 9001 certified. So we have to go through regular processes and we have to validate all the stuff that we do. We do 27002 validation, like I said, 2C262, N74 safety fire control requirements for some of the stuff that we work on. I'll, I'll use that as an anecdote later, um, which was pretty funny, especially in the room we're in. Um, so yeah, ultimately, let's get started. Um, I want to not take too much time all by myself here. I, I thought that I'll, I'll come up with a few ideas and I'll get us started and then I'd love for us to throw the microphone around and, and have other people share anecdotes as well. So mine are not the, the, the best ones, I'm sure. I, I, I had to redact all the customer names, so don't ask me for customer names. I'm not going to shame anyone in particular, um, although I would love to. <laughs> uh, I'm not going to do that. Um, all right. There's more than one way to skin the cat. What I mean by that is, um, 
together with the, the amazing evolution of, of all the capacity of the Linux kernel itself, the tremendous work that Grant by himself did over there, and, and the benefits of things like Device Tree that made it so much easier to run on, on those smaller platforms. We, we now have, literally anyone can do it. And I'm not joking about that. I made my sister do it. She's a makeup artist, and I made my sister build embedded OSs just for the hell of it, because now I can say that. My, my sister can do it, literally. Um, there are so many tools, there's so many ways to do that, there's so many embedded recipes, there's so many, no pun intended, I, I didn't do that intentionally, um, all, all these different solutions work. And I'm not going to pretend the one that Collabora uses is the best, because I'll tell you what, the first thing you learn when you do that for a while is you never get it your way. Um, we have a lot of people that call us up three months before start of production. And they're like throwing their hands in the air. They're literally, everything's blowing up behind them. It's all on fire. And they're saying, can you guys help us? I'm like, your start of production is tomorrow. What do you want us to do? They're like, oh, so we have this tool chain. We have this platform. We've picked all these components. There's all of that. And there's this pile of fire over here. Can you put it out for us? It's like, come on. That happens, what, twice a week, right? Um, I get to take those calls. Um, that, that's what I do. Um, so those are not the best examples. Sometimes we get in early enough and, and you need to build a report with the customer. You need to take a couple of fires out before they, they address you early enough and they say, okay, 2020, we're going to make this. We're going to build this robot. It's going to jump. It's going to run. It's going to shake his head. It's going to do all this stuff. They sell you the moon and they say, and we're going to do all of that with, you know, this brand new um, IMX8 CPU platform. And you're like, okay, great. Let, let's do that together. And you, you start putting the pieces uh, together. You figure out what storage you're going to use, what kind of memory mapping is going to be there. You work on schematics with them. And, and that usually works a little better. That happens once a year. And usually we drink a lot and we celebrate. And, and that, that's great. Um, the rest of the time, it's somewhere in the middle of the road where it's not quite always on fire and you can't quite help with the hardware design, but you find somewhere in the middle. But very often, some of the technical decisions are already made for you and you just have to run with it. So um, the, the guys at Pengutronics did a great job with their PTXD solution and sometimes we work with their customers and so we have to embrace their solution. We're not gonna come in and say, you have to throw everything out and we're gonna start all over again. That just, that's not productive, that, that's not what we do. Um, though sometimes you'd like to be able to do that, but, but you can't. So um, like I said, there's tons of ways to do this. There is no one right answer. Uh, I wanted to simplify stuff and, and sort of leap into that. So we all are familiar with this picture. You typically have a few critical services or apps or agents that the device will do. Um, let's just say, for example, you're, um, um, I'll, I'll pretend we're working on a robotic vacuum. You know, those things, they started, Roomba was making them, they were a thousand euros, and, and now you can buy them on Amazon for 99 euros, and they're at your door the next day. They do the same stuff. The vast majority of them use free software, only free software, pretty much. Uh, if you're not familiar with the Ross project, most of them use that pretty much out of the box. It's, it's kind of amazing and, and really powerful, and very encouraging. So they do very few things. They need to do these things well. They have a bunch of sensors. You need to make them talk to each other. And some of them um, run Linux. Some of them have more sources set. But you bring it up. You have a few apps, a few libraries. Then you start making a few different products. And then you take those few libraries. You take those few apps. And you bring the Linux kernel. You mix them together. And then you know with product A, B, and C very quickly. And, and when you make a few products and a few iterations, it quickly becomes a mess because you have all these lines and they all mix up and then engineers go on vacation and the last build was built on their machine and then you don't remember that and then the same, it just keeps getting worse and worse and worse. Then the team grows and then it gets distributed and, and it's horrible. So um, at Collabra, we have a ton of Debian developers, DDs, and we use Debian for a lot of stuff. And people always ask me, but why does it matter for embedded? I mean, you, you're talking about stuff that typically is server containers, desktops, etc. cetera. Um, the good thing is those things are tested. They work together. Um, it's the same credit and benefits you get from Red Hat. So it's the same stuff you get from SUSE. Like there's a, there's a benefit to the hardening enterprise, the, the capacity of testing things together, building them together, making sure they work, making sure they're, they're integrated and, and, and they work well together. When, you pick up random people's recipes on GitHubs or worse, so like some FTP site, and then you, you start t testing them. You're, you're never quite sure what you get. Whereas here we have a finite, and we understand, we understand that quite well ourselves. So that, that's really quite, quite nice. 
So um, the way that we do things is, pr first and foremost, uh, I don't think I've heard enough people say it yesterday, so I just wanted to put this slide at the beginning and, and re-emphasize that. CI is everything. If, if you're going to do embedded, the only thing that's going to ever save your life is you need to do continuous integration all the time. Um, and you need to do continuous integration. That's the only thing you need to think about. Like, it doesn't matter what your product does. If you can't do it in a loop and you can't repeatedly repeat it and integrate your tests from all aspects of it, you, you have to be able to do that. If you can't do that, if your developers themselves can't do that, your product will fail. I guarantee you that somewhere your product will fail. Uh, you can't just build once and forget. Because if you do that, it's just terrible. It, it affects security. People talked about security a lot yesterday. If you build it once and forget, your security is going to suck. Um, these are typically the project we see that everything runs as uh, user zero. There is one process that acts as the system manager, that's the configuration manager, that spawns all the children. Uh, it's, it's horrible. Please don't do that. You'd be amazed how many customers we have that do that. They have one, they, they, they have a PID zero, maybe PID one, and then their PID two is called like system manager. That's, that's it. And then system manager, supposedly is like they reinvented hot water, it does everything well, and it starts the screen compositor, and then it controls the thread that handles network configuration, and, and, and those other things that generally work okay, and then everything goes south from that. Please don't do that. Um, so yeah, the loop idea is basically a few building blocks. I've used a few examples of projects that we use a lot. Um, many thanks to Linaro. Uh, they've been doing a great job with tools for a long time. Um, people think of kernel CI a lot. Let's remember that under kernel CI, there's a lot of tools, Lava and, and Lava 2 more recently, is a good example of that where um, being able to set up these systems is important. Um, the guys at Bellibre, ourselves, some of the other consultancies have been doing a lot of work to ease that. I wish I had included images of this. We have, we have build farms all over the place and we have esoterical beat devices all over the place. So we have Google Chromebooks turned up upside down with things plugged into them in ways you don't want to know. We violate those devices all day long. We, we, we extract the PSU interfaces so that we can remotely control that. We have uh, slave devices that, that reconfigure switches or that we jump GPIO pins or different interfaces inside of them so that we can network boot them, so that we can ne network manage their power uh, out of board for a lot of them. And, and yeah, that's not very pleasant. Very often your customers don't think about stuff like that when, when what you're working on some like fitness device, they don't worry about this type of use cases. So you have to make their device do that for you for the purpose of those tests. Again, it's really critical, it's very important. And, and you have to be able to continuously do that kind of stuff. So we are, um, uh, we're pretty good at doing this now. Um, and it makes our life easier, um, of course. All of that is only as good as your tests are. I mean, let's, let's not uh, forget that. The testers never get enough credit, and uh, I want to re-emphasize that. The, the quality of the testing is, is really critical. So let me give you another quick view of, of what that looks like. This is a, an example of a project we run. We use a, a bunch of pieces in there. I've, I've used project examples that I personally like. Um, the thing at the center of this, which is kind of weird because I just mentioned Debian, right? Um, all, of our, all of our package sources are packaged in a Debian format. Um, that's what we use for virtually everything that we do. Um, and, and we're very, uh, very good at it. And now we can train our customers. It's funny because at first it's perceived as a huge barrier of adoption. People come to us and say, oh, this is like five files and then configurations and then folders. And within half an hour, we have them up and running and they, they build a Debian package as if it was nothing. Could be an RPM, could be some other stuff we happen to use, uh, Debian packages. It works well for us. Um, but the one thing we did is, how many of you here are familiar with the open build system? Yeah, of course. Um, uh, we use OBS for virtually every single project that we do. Uh, we, we use a package-based approach for producing the software. Now, a lot of you are probably cringing because you're thinking, all I have is a, non-device that's 64 megabyte, and there's absolutely no freaking way that their stuff is gonna fit on my device. My root file system must be much smaller than that. Forget about this. What I said is we use Debian formats to produce the software, 
By the time we make a file system and an image for your device, all that stuff is gone. We stripped everything out. You would have no idea that that's how we produce the software. We can make it as small as 30 megabytes and have a fully Debian compliant file system that just doesn't have any Debian traces left in it or RPM based system in it or anything like that. We, we've automated and bootstrapped and created our tooling so that we can remove all of that. But we start from a very well known quantity, something that has, you know, 1,200 maintainers that are known, we have their email address, we know they're in the CVEs, we know they deal with security, we know they do the updates, we know they have millions of servers, they have millions of users that are using it. So I'm not just trusting some guy's recipe behind a blog that put a few lines together that pretends that that stuff's working. I know that the stuff is working when we start, or at least it's working well enough that we can track back its origin, we know the patch sets that have been applied on it and all that, which is really powerful for us. Uh, we use GitLab self-hosted for a lot of our projects when we can. Very often it's on the customer side. And we still have customers using SVN. We still have customers not using any source control systems at all. I kid you not. Um, and you have to integrate. You have to adapt. Um, being a small company, being very flexible, being having access to infrastructure makes it easier for us to solve some of those problems. We're outside the firewall, we're on the public internet, we have IPv6, we have IPv4 exposed systems, so we can provide hosting infrastructure. And we do this in a very secure way. Somebody was joking, you just start with HTTPS. It's a good place to start, but then managing credentials when you have multi-tenant systems, when you have solutions where you're exposing um, sometimes the customer's own IP, the value add on top of the free software, you have to be very careful about that. And, and we are usually pretty careful about that. So yeah, we use OBS and we build there, we have access to a very nice granular authorization and, and it's very powerful and it builds ARM32 and ARM64 very well, which is the big difference for us because um, it's really cute when you make a small device and then it builds in an hour um, because your software stack is pretty simple. Um, but like I said, a lot of our customers have screens attached to their device and it means you need a complete tool chain including a toolkit and a graphical environment so that they can do stuff. And in today's day and age, very often, even on a very small footprint device, because they are powerful enough, that means a web runtime. And if you rebuild a web runtime too often on your machine, you're killing our little planet. Um, the orangutan hates you, I hate you, because there's no need to redo that all the time. So if you have a solution like OBS that controls your source tree and your binary trees and your repositories, and all you do is rebuild these images, your engineers can just iterate on that stuff. And trust me, nobody wants to be building LibreOffice on their own little board or their cross-compile environment too often. It's, it's not fun. It, it is not, it's not something you, you want to be doing too often. It's something we do too often, but we do it for all of our customers, and we try to optimize that. But please don't put LibreOffice on your embedded device, unless you really need to. Um, we, we have to in, in some cases. So, that's the build process. Like I said, then we, we, we reuse those environments. We have an image creation tool that manages that. Some other platforms we use, we use Jenkins extensively. We're not married to it. We use Geek Labs. Yeah, we have some customers and some other stuff, but Jenkins have been really good to us. And so, so we use that to basically automate all the stuff that can't really be automated naturally by itself. So those scripts enable us to do some really cool stuff. It pilots the whole infrastructure. It basically gives the continuous integration, the looping capability that I was just talking about. Uh, we use Lava for all of the coordination of the, the board, the board bring up, uh, imaging them, flashing them, making sure they boot, making sure we can deploy tests to them, we can report back the test results through it. It's, it's very powerful for that. And of course, you need some way of, of automating some of that stuff. So we use, um, we use Fabricator uh, for a lot of our projects to give us the issue management, the ticket management, the tasks management, so we have some uh, views on, on the projects. We use uh, work boards a lot. So, so a lot of the projects are based on um, uh, agile methodologies when the customer are okay with that. Typically two week sprints, a bunch of engineers, we iterate through that. It's all basically managed through Fabricator. But the reason it's also on this slide is that it gives us some nice integration like Jenkins could automatically create tickets through uh, when something fails, the Lava test can automatically report tickets. Um, when some of the reviewing process, that also automatically generate tickets. So you can track literally from an upstream merger magic from Debian or from Ubuntu source package change 
we can track that git commit to our repositories all the way to like a lava CI fix have changed or failed. And we can bisect our own continuous integration loop through that if something broke in our circuit or to the origin if there was something wrong with the potential source origin change. All right? I have no idea how I'm doing on time. What time is it, please? Thank you. Um, not everybody at once, please. <laughs> One of the tools that we built, I wanted to mention real quick, is the Debian OS Builder. Because, you know, yet another imaging tool. Why not? Um, I wasn't part of the decision of making one, but I have to say what the team has done is really quite cool. It's uh, Go-based. It uses simple YAML files to do it, and it's action-based action driven. It's really easy to use. It's very easily extendable. And we've been using it for quite some time now on quite a few projects, and it works really, really well for us. So I invite you to consider taking a look at it if you're interested into making images and you want something that's really highly reproducible and that's easy to use. Um, uh, we're really quite happy with it and it works well for us. So I wanted to give you a quick example on how you put an ARM64 image together from a, a standard Debian stretch solution. These are the simple actions you want to produce. So literally they translate into an action inside the script. Instead of just running through the slide, I'll just look at, you can't read that. Sorry about that. But basically each and every one of those steps basically describe what's written over here. You define how you want to bootstrap the image. You give it a name. And then you define which packages you want. This example is really dumb. It only installs sudo, OpenSSH, add user, systemd, csv, and firmware Linux, because why not? Uh, it creates the user, it configures a few things, etc. Literally, the script is uh, 30 lines, 25 lines, and that's what you get. It packs the image at the end, and, and you're done. All right, like I said, Continuous integration is the key. I think I heard somebody else is going to talk about that today, and, and thank you so much for doing that. Um, that's, that's how we deliver this stuff. There's another really nice value in building software this way, which is for our developers and our customers in particular. It enables us to create developer kits. And you're like, why would you worry about doing that? Everybody's running Linux, right? Well, I, I know that's not true. I know many of us are too busy now. We have kids and... And people are lazy, they're running Windows, they're running Mac OS, they have a bunch of virtual machines, but it's harder to get sort of that cohesive developer environment that you can share with guys that are in Thailand, guys that are in Vietnam, guys that are in India. And I kid you not, that's the type of developer sites that we're dealing with today. There are people that are fresh out of college, they have limited IT experience, they, they've learned some Linux embedded at school, but you need to standardize all of that. So by being able to put an SDK VM for all of your projects really gives you a tremendous power and control over the tool chain across the integration and all that. So what we do is we put together a, a virtual machine that runs on the developer's Windows machine that's controlled by their 300,000 employees plus IT department. Um, because that's always a problem, you know? And then you need to be very careful about supporting proxies and integration because they don't have direct access to their, their own developer sites and all that. It's, it's, it's really interesting challenges. Um, when we can, we add an emulator on top of it, and, and that helps quite a lot. Um, and it, like I said, it's portable. But the most important thing is the first bullet on that slide, the fact that the developer environment that we provide to them, if the host leaks into it in any way, shape, or form, or if something is not configured properly, the VM that runs the SDK is literally source code identical to the target. So everything that ends up running there runs the exact same way that you eventually will run on the target. It makes cross-compiling a lot easier. It makes creating those, those environments a lot easier. And it enables workflows like this, where you can literally develop and compile all by yourself with a branch on the SDK and, and test in the SDK. Um, and do that repeatedly. You can deploy and have OBS do some of the building for you, and then you can, de you can develop and cross-compile on the SDK and test on the SDK again. You get an SDK, you get the emulators whenever that's possible, and then you get that, and it's pretty cool. You can also deploy on target from the SDK as well, so you get whatever esoterical connection you get. Ideally, some network access with an SSH daemon on your target, or you have some debug interface that enables you to push files to the target. Um, Worst case, you, you use micro SD or you use some other kind of movable storage. 
um, which is a little bit more troublesome. But there's some way of deploying to the target and you do that. Ideally, you want to not have to rebuild an image every time you want to change the thing that makes the LEDs blink on the device because that's the only thing you're working on. Or you don't want to test your sensor and have to rebuild an image every time you want to deploy the changes you're making just to your sensor agent or kernel module. And then eventually you can deploy through the packaging system, create a whole image, install and test that way. So again, that's the, that's the picture overall of what it is that uh, we tend to do, the tools that we like, the way that we do things um, uh, frequently, but not all of the time, because very often we inherit stuff that, that already is there. All right, that was the quick and boring part of it. Then I wanted to give some quick example and anecdotes. When I talked to people um, yesterday, they said that they thought that would be more interesting. So I'll do that real quick, and then I would really love to ask you guys to participate and share some stuff as well. So, Embedded Linux, where does it start? It starts right here. If you can't read this or that, there's a test at the end of the presentation on page 12. Um, data sheets and schematics are where everything starts. If you can't deal with the schematics or if you can't read the data sheet properly, you can't really work on Embedded Linux. I mean, let's be honest with each other. Hardware enablement is a big part of it. And then generally, when you build up that stack, yes, eventually just application development kicks in and, and that's just as critical. But for the type of work that we end up doing very often, um, these are important. And I start with anecdotes there. The number of erroneous data sheets we've had to deal with in the past is incredible. Like the, the documentation we start with is wrong. And you get the wrong ranges, you get the wrong registers, you get the wrong mark pinouts on the documentation itself. So when you get tasked, and there's some guys in the back that are crying right now, um, you, you get asked to create a module for something and then you base yourself on the trust you had and the register information that you get. Now, and it doesn't work. And it, it turns out that the die wasn't printed the way that the document said it was. It's kind of frustrating. But then you move one level up from that. So let's just assume that the chip or chipset itself works the way that it's intended, it's documented properly, then you can write and work on that. The schematics on how the actual board you're working on um, needs to be mapped out properly. These two examples are, are documents that are publicly available. The one on the left is the All Winner A20 example. And the one on the right is some free and open hardware uh, All Winner A20 based board that I just picked yesterday randomly. I should put the credits up. I'll make a version of it that links to those documents. Um, yeah, that's it. So th those are the first two examples I wanted to give. Data sheets are critical. Schematics are really important. Um, and that, that's where things start. But let me give you some, some casual, casual and, uh, examples. Um, this one is so sad. Uh, <laughs> um, between hardware revisions, uh, we usually, we typically, depending on the, the market that you're working on, you get, so everything starts, everybody here is familiar with the workflow, how typically things work. So in a fairly large product enterprise, what happens is that they decide on making a product, then there is a whole workflow that kicks in. They, they are gonna try to source an SOC vendor to start with. So they're picking a platform. Uh, say they line up Freescale, Qualcomm, uh, Samsung. Um, they're looking at, um, at many of those other vendors uh, and they're trying to, to pick something that they wanna work with. Um, and that gets selected and usually the BSP is not good enough. So there's a first RFQ that goes out for some company to help them customize and harden the RFQ for them. Make it faster, make it more secure, make it more reliable and you start working on that. That usually takes a year to two years. And then at that point, uh, the dev boards for that particular vendor become available, so you get development boards that are the reference boards for that. I'll use Renesas as an example because I really like Renesas. They do a good job at uh, promoting open source. They've really adopted it inside of their own uh, organization, and, and they're pretty cool that way. So um, the RCAR3 um, SOC platform is a very successful automotive chip that they're doing today. It has a whole bunch of ARM cores, 64-bit, has a powerful GPU, has a, a lot of interfaces inside of it. It's, it's, it's a nice system. And they make a bunch of different boards. So they, they're also one of the very first automotive geared uh, SOC vendors. If you can't tell, I do a lot of work in automotive. Um, uh, they make, they're the first one that made a, a fairly low cost, easily accessible starter kit. So you can get a, a base, basically SOM type board with a lot of interfaces on it for like 300 US dollars maybe 400. Um, and there you, you actually have you know, HDMI out, uh, Ethernet built in, you have a bunch of antenna interfaces, there's a ton of video in, video out, and stuff like that. It's really kind of cool. 
And then there's the expansion port interfaces because you would want to be able to add CAN bus and a bunch more uh, USBs and, and things like that. So you can easily do that. So that evolves and then that takes you know, another year usually. Uh, and then I know this sounds crazy. Like people think startup time, we're going to make a product in six months and all that. It, it, it doesn't work that way. It just, it just doesn't. It, the reality is everything takes longer than people, most people expect. So at that point, you get some asample hardware. Usually that means that it's mostly soldered together, but usually some assembly required still. Um, so, so you work with that, and that's where that, that one anecdote comes in. And things are mapped out in a certain way. So your PCB vendor produces that for you, or some of our customers are big enough that they do that in-house. They have those capacity in-house. And then they give you a map out, and it starts working. Then you get the B samples, where things are a little bit more polished. We've addressed some of the issues that we identified on the first one. Um, but then for some reason, the guys that put the boards together decided to mount the LEDs the other way around. So the stuff that was working on the sample doesn't work anymore because they plug things the wrong way. And that's one example. This is another example. You, you want to flash over the spy interface and then they tell you, I guarantee you it's three volt logic. And then you do that. And then on the sample it works. And then you get the B sample and they plug the power rails the wrong way. And now you're at five volt or you're 3.3 and you're pulling your hair out because it works for them in their lab, but the version of the boards they gave you don't work. And that happens way more often than you guys think. Another example. That happens way too often. Way too often. And we get that on debug interfaces. We have people plugging G tags the wrong way around on the boards. We have this stuff, because remember, these are not just the boards that um, that are the reference boards. They're the first ones that the, the customers are assembling or the customers are paying for somebody to assemble. And, and I hear a few people laughing. I think you, you faced some of this. The next one is one that I really like, where you, you go back and forth, and then very often there is language barrier. You're talking about you know, people that, that speak in other languages, and you're like, I guarantee you, you just slide the card I sent you in the back of the thing. And it's, it's very, a lot of those are safety rated products. So you can't take the, the, carry, the, the casing is, is molded inside of it. You, it's hard to break apart and all that. They're like, and it's right there. And you're like, and you go back and forth, and you're like, no, it's not there. And eventually they send you a picture, and, and, and of course their casing looks different than the one you have because the vendor didn't bother cut open the port for the debugging on the version that you got. So they tell you, well, this is where you cut, and this is how you plug the debug board on the device. That happens way more often than you'd like. Okay, another good example. When your embedded device is this big, and your embedded big device is this far, please make sure you don't forget the power you supply because it's a problem. I kid you not, that happens. Um, this is really big, but this is still in some ways for some of the products we work on a, an embedded device and uh, some of the logic on there, the hardening. You have no idea what kind of testing you have to make to make sure that the stuff that lives on that stuff lives for that long. We said, you know, Linux runs on the space station. It's on, on a lot of other stuff. I mean, there are things on the ground here that are hard to do. This is, this is hard to do. These guys have rough jobs. Um, another one, you work with the customer for a while and they say, you know, we're working with you on a digital amplifier and we have this interface and you're working on this. You never, an interesting thing is you never quite fully understand what kind of products you're working on. And, and I have another example about that later, but the customer says, yeah, I'll just send you a sample so you can test yourself. And you're like, okay, how bad can it be? You know, it's going to be a box. It's going to fit on the developer's desk. It's going to be all right. Yeah. And then eventually you start the paperwork and you're realizing this is not exactly what I was thinking. And then you get a little further in the paperwork and then you realize it's going to require a crane. It's going to require us to take a window out of the office. It's going to require us to harden the floor because that thing is actually going to come as a complete fireproof 42U rack, fully equipped with the redundant power supplies and everything else because that's the only way they know how to deliver their product. Um, Oh yeah, and when we had to get electricians come in because we didn't have the power to actually power that thing because it's a special type of power on that thing as well. But again, the thing we were working on was literally like a $5 um, single SOC uh, micro board that had an Ethernet interface on one side, some GPIO RS interfaces on the other one that literally could have managed to fit in my pocket, but it turned into a 700 kilos or 1,500 pounds, 220 volt two-phase device that we had to deal with. That's 
interesting. That's still in the office. We're not, it's never going to leave. We're renting the space. The, the thing is going to be there when we move out. I, I don't care what penalty we're going to have. We're not moving that. Um, another good example is um, we, we, really, we, we work on free software and open software. Everything we do is that way. But a lot of the integration we do requires other third-party components, whether that's access to an SDK that's proprietary or that's access to some IP that's proprietary. So we sign NDAs all the time. I don't even read them anymore. I like I sign my life off. It's like, whatever, yes, there you go. Take it, give us the information. Let's make this work. Um, but sometimes you require peripherals as well. And I have a perfect example of that, which is um, we do a lot of um, uh, the Apple terrible company product integration. And in free software, it's, it's not fun. It's, it's not something we enjoy doing. Um, but you have to because they're pretty pervasive and they have a large amount of market share. So um, we refuse to buy Apple products. So usually when a customer wants us to integrate, they send it to us and then we test it with them and usually we either lose them or we break them or we break them or we break them. Uh, not usually intentionally, but sometimes. Um, but very often, it's funny, they send us the device and they have no idea what the passwords on them are or, or you can't do anything because they're locked down or they've already been used before and the amount of time you waste by not sharing the right information, like the schematics I've mentioned before or the data sheet or something as simple as they send you a test device and don't actually know what the credentials are on the device. Like, by the time it's shipped and you get it and it clears customs and then you start testing it and it, you, sometimes you waste a week before that stuff goes out. So yeah, that's not fun. Um, a last example I wanted to give on that is like the idea side of things. Like, it's really incredible how often we don't know what we're working on. Our customers are very secretive, and you're only a piece of the puzzle. You're working on a you know zero latency real time video playback pipeline. Like they say, we need every frame. We need subframe rendering. We we work with Xilinx FPGAs where we only have partial frame rendering, and we need to be able to basically shove that through the entire pipeline so that. Even with partial image acquisition, we need to be able to already restream re encode and, and push it out. Um, and, and so you know it's something that needs to be very fast. And, but they don't tell us. So there's a ton of um, medical devices is a good example where we don't know what we're working on. They, they give us a very specific piece of the puzzle. We have all the specs for what we're working on, but we don't know if it ends up being a microscopic uh, a camera for surgery assistance or, or, or anything different from that. But um, that's another interesting challenge of, of some of the, the customers that we typically work with is like, we don't know what we're working on. So these were mostly hardware and projects related, but now I want to give you some specific project examples of challenges where, um, you remember those examples that like the deadline is 90 days from now or three weeks from now, the start of production is starting, we're completely behind. Um, hurry and wait is something that happens to us all the time. They say, we signed the contract, we're ready to go, they send us all the documentation and say, you have to be on site, you have to help us with this. And, like, uh, we don't typically do that. We like to work from home. We work in our pajamas. We like watching TV when we work. We, it's comfortable. We have our bench power supply right there. We have our fast internet access for most of us. Um, that needs to be more pervasive. And, and that's how we typically work. But sometimes you can't avoid it. You have to go on site because that 42U rack is just not going to move itself. Um, so you do that and you show up and uh, you show up right on time, maybe five minutes late because going through security takes longer than you would expect and you have to give your passport and sign your life away again. They take your cell phone away, they strip search you. Some of the sites we work on, they literally weigh you on the way in. There is no bathroom inside and they weigh you on the way out and they make sure you didn't take anything out or you didn't leave anything in. Um, it's, it's really pleasant environments. If you bring something that has a camera, you never want to use it again because you are violated. Like they literally will use X-ray technology to scan the data out of your mass storage devices and they'll keep it forever. Um, don't take your phone or laptop when you go visit these customers. Um, but yeah, that's, literally that happens. And, um, and then you sit there in a meeting room, not like this one, uh, for days uh, while they try to figure out why their build environment doesn't work. Um, and they can't give you software to work on. That's day one, and then day two, same thing. So then you start making games and you start scratching numbers on the wall and uh, you really feel like a prisoner. But that happens all the time, um, unfortunately. Five minutes? Okay, so that's one example. Um, I'm gonna skip the other one because I wanna hear from you guys. So um, that's me. Uh, anybody has an anecdote they wanna share of a project that they want, something they wanna get off your, their chest, something that that didn't work exactly the way that they had wanted to. You must have some. 
You must have some. Catch it. Yeah. <laughs> Let's try again. <laughs> I could keep on going for the whole day. I don't know how much time you guys have, but uh, it's, it's fun. It's, it's also very rewarding to actually see your work in the market. And very often there are things you can't just readily buy, but um, some of the smaller projects we work on, like a, a Bluetooth speaker. Most of the Bluetooth speakers have, uh, have um, embedded Linux systems. They use, they use Conman, they use uh, Network Manager, they use Bluezy. Um, it's kind of fun. And, and those you can easily buy, they're fairly cheap. Things like the Chrome OS, Chromebooks, and all that, uh, Android-based devices are, are all things that we work on. You, you had an example, some of your friends in China. Yeah, so some of my friends in China, they have really crazy hours. And one of the reasons is like, if you work with a Xiaomi or a Huawei or one of those big Chinese companies, and you have a problem with your you know, microcontroller or whatever, they basically keep you until three o'clock. And then uh, the next day you have to show up at eight o'clock until the problem's fixed. Otherwise, it's like, you're not getting out until like the middle of the night. So. Yeah, that's a good yeah. example, yeah, we have, we have guys that are definitely burning the midnight oil. Um, and like I said, many of them work from home, so that becomes a challenge. There is another idea in the back over there. Thank you, Da. Yeah. Um, I have another example. Uh, I was doing uh, in-flight entertainment. Yep. So the screens that you have in front of you when you are flying. And all this hardware is uh, following a very strict process regarding the uh, uh, traceability and all this stuff. And usually with this kind of embedded systems, when you see the failure, it's up to the software to fix it, even yeah. if it's an hardware failure. So you have no choice. You have to find a, a, a way around to make it work. And usually the software is coming at last. Yes. So the hardware guys are making their prototypes. They go up to production. It gets sold off. You have a, a, a green tick on it. And then it, it is given back to the software guys. I know you have a few time because the hardware is in late. But the delivery the date is still the same. And it's up to the software to fix everything. And that's a great example. Thank you so much. Yeah, the, uh, where you're the software guys, you're going to have to work around it. Um, that works way too often. Like we can solve way too many issues with workarounds in software. There are a few cases where it just cannot be done, and, and that creates gigantic problems because sometimes they started making the products, and you're like, well, this needs five volt here. This, this needs five volt. You're giving it 3.3 volt. We can't fix that in software. But are you sure there is nothing you can do? It is, I'm pretty sure there's nothing we can do here. Um, In-flight entertainment is a good example of some challenging projects, yes. Especially, there's a lot of retrofits. They want to add features. The customers' expectations keep growing, so they want to add more stuff. It's a, it's a, it's a good example of, of, of projects, absolutely. Somebody else? No? I think we're almost... Oh, Grant. So uh, on the software fixes, the, the fun, one that was the most fun I worked on, PowerPC board uh, built up, of course, the data bits are numbered differently. And so the board was built, and all the entire data bus and address bus was wired. No, address bus was fine. Data bus was wired backwards. <laughs> Complete mess. We still had to make it work because it was too expensive to, to respin the board. Mm -hmm. And actually, RAM was fine, but we had to have a complete custom flash driver to do all the flash commands. It was insane. Yeah, thank you, thank you, software. Thank you, software, for being able to fix that. It's just, it's terrible, but it happens way too often. All right, I think we're out of time. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you so very much for being at Embedded Recipes today. I think you have a great lineup of speakers after that. So um, I wish you a wonderful day, and thank you so much for giving me a chance to speak. <laughs>